Hello and welcome to Kingston Now. I'm Jimmy Buff. This week we have some live local music with Burnell Pines. We'll talk to Sarah Eckel, a local author getting national attention for her new book, It's Not You, 27 Wrong Reasons You're Single. And we start with Peter Aaron, music editor for Chronogram and author of a new book, If You Like the Ramones, here are over 200 bands, CDs, films, and other oddities that you will love. That's a title for a book. <laughs> it's kind of busy, isn't it? It is, yeah. but it says it all, right? It, it does. It's, it's, it's uh, as far as uh, self-explanatory titles go, um, I think it's probably uh, up there at the top. Now, is there a, a psychographic for punk rock? For the, or, and do the Ramones actually fit into punk rock? Because they really did cross over mainstream. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, the Ramones are seen uh, by most people as being the first true punk rock band. In America. I mean, yeah, yeah. And, and, when, and actually, well, anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly there was proto-punk bands that were sort of had a lot of the main signature elements of punk and of uh, what the Ramones did that came a little bit before them. But they were really the first group that kind of, um, an example of which every, all of that coalesced and fit a certain moment of time and, and launched the punk explosion. I mean, they influenced the Sex Pistols and the Clash and all the, all the English bands. And everyone who couldn't play an instrument and plugged in in their garage. There right, after, exactly. Right? Just, yeah. just kind of bring, bringing it back to rock and roll, back to what it was uh, kind of originally meant to be, which is a fun populist music that spoke really directly to, uh, to kids. Um, we got a, setting the scene uh, somewhat to sort of cons uh, uh, put across the the uh, context of what was going on with the Ramones when when they started. Uh, they had grown up themselves with fun, energetic, early rock and roll from the 1950s that they heard when they were really young, and then they were kind of right high school age when the British invasion hit. And uh, rock and roll after those. Uh, eras had kind of taken a turn where it was more serious and was just sort of trying to be more adult. And, you know, if you grew up uh, loving rock and roll and, and loving uh, Little Richard and uh, Stone's Satisfaction and the early Who, uh, Summer Breeze makes me feel fine, blowing through the candies in my mind, it's not really going to cut it, <laughs> you know. So they kind of, you know, brought it, stripped it back down and stripped it down in an extreme way. Actually, you could even say arguably stripped uh, rock and roll down to something more minimal and energetic than even the syncopated blues based music of the early rock and rollers. Um, so, so is there, uh, is there a, a, a mold for someone who likes the Ramones that enables you to say, well, if you like that, you'll like this? Well, the, the thing that's, yeah, I mean, the, certainly a, a big part of, um, of, uh, of the book are, are the artists that influenced the Ramones. And also there's uh, their contemporaries and artists that were influenced by the Ramones. So using that logic, like, hey, you know. All these things are things that you should like also. But I've also got a chapter in there about non-musical uh, subjects, cartoons, uh, weird TV shows that were on when they were kids, like the Munsters, um, uh, the Honeymooners, things like that, uh, comic books, weird movies, cult movies. That they, These are things that absorbed and shaped them as people. And that comes out in the music in some ways, in Indeed. a lot of ways. It, it would not have been the band they were without those things, you know. Maybe that, not obvious to a lot of people, but. And, and now you're a rock and roller yourself. Um, you grew up out in the Midwest, and you started playing music when you were a teenager, like many kids did, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Actually, I moved to Cincinnati, Ohio when I was 16. Uh, my childhood before that time was spent in northern New Jersey, Morris County. Uh, I didn't really, you know, I, I liked rock and roll and music, but I didn't really connect with it until punk in the 70s. And that felt like, you know, I, the, the, the stuff I was hearing on the radio, Stones and the Beatles and the Who, I kind of liked it, but it felt kind of still like big kids music. And uh, yeah, we, we just couldn't relate to it a, a, as much. Later on, I got the perspective and I was re able to relate to it in the way that I can relate to any music I like. But punk really connected with me. And I was an outsider and that was a big part of the reason, you know, I didn't feel like I fit in. Uh, I was in one of the first hardcore bands in New Jersey. I was a sort of the age bracket where I was a little bit too young to take part in the beginnings of the punk wave, but started playing it, and then hardcore was a harder, faster version of that for 
you know, kids that were a little bit, little bit young for the first wave of punk. Then when I was 16, I moved to Ohio uh, after a couple years of uh, studying journalism at Boston University, 83 to 85. I ended up back in Cincinnati. I got uh, involved in the club scene as a promoter. I promoted, uh, uh, booked about five or six different small clubs. I booked Nirvana on their first couple of tours, Flaming Lips, White Zombie, uh, the, uh, the Melvins, whoever, you know, I wrote man managed Afghan Wigs on their first tour. They were local guys that were friends of mine. But that, that's what was going on. But, you know, Nirvana, those first couple of tours, like 20, 30 people, nobody knew who they right. were. Most of these bands slept on my floor <laughs> in the van. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, I, I kind of started playing music again after taking some time off to concentrate on promoting. And I started a band called The Chrome Cranks with uh, guitarist William Weber, who uh, moves back to Cincinnati, lives back there now. But we moved to New York in 1992, found a couple other guys, started playing with. Uh, bass player uh, Jerry Teal had been in a group called The Honeymoon Killers. We had a couple different drummers, and we found the drummer that was best for us was Bob Burt, who was uh, in Sonic Youth early on. He was in a group called Pussy Galore later on. Now he's playing with Lydia Lunch. And uh, we did that for a few years, and... Uh, you know, it, it kind of beat us up, and we broke up, and then after about 13 years, we started playing again, new record. And yeah, last year you put out a new record, which got really terrific reviews. Yeah, people people still yeah. like it. I don't. It's crazy. You're a music <laughs> editor for Chronogram on top of that, so you're writing great music reviews about terrific local music, and you're actually doing a reading for this book this Friday night at Inquiring Minds in New Paltz, and I believe that reading is between, uh, starts at 7 o'clock on seven, Friday night? 7 o'clock, yeah, yeah. Well, terrific. We enjoy your work with the Chronogram. This looks like a terrific new book. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks so much, Jimmy. Thank you. You're watching Kingston Now. Next, it's author Sarah Eckel to talk about her new book, It's Not You, 27 Wrong Reasons You're Single.